Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8. See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? My name's Adam Terrell, and I'm here to encourage you to obey the law and think about it and speak about it constantly. I broke the law. Christ paid my debt by sacrificing himself so that I can be clean to offer myself as a living sacrifice back to God. The entire Mosaic law is obligatory for everyone. Keeping some of the laws look different today because the light of further revelation supersedes shadows in the old law. The temple sacrifices are an example where we have something better. Note that we must still obey the Mosaic laws for sacrifices. There is still a temple, and priests are still required to offer sacrifices. It's just that the priests, the sacrifices, and the temple are all better now. God will show grace to those who apply the law to themselves, to those who have hidden the law in their hearts, and he will judge those who disobey accordingly. I must apply it to myself, and then those around me will see its fruit and be drawn to its goodness. Theocracy grows by the sword of the Spirit, God's word, and self-sacrifice. The law's purpose is to give a path to restoration. Christ has restored me, so I must seek to restore others by sacrificing myself. Thanks for listening. My goal with each conversation is to edify and bring the law and wisdom to bear on each person's current situation in life. Let's jump into this week's interview. I grew up up north, actually, in New York, uh, Plattsburgh, New York. Um, Nothing going on up there. We moved in the Albany area probably back in 99. A little mischievous kid, a little juvenile delinquent, honestly, in and out of a couple group homes growing up. I was 13 years old, and I got arrested with a small possession of weed. I ended up robbery uh, back in 2003. Ended up doing real time in prison, five years. Goodness. Yeah, I mean, but while I was in there, I, I began to focus. You know, I got home, got a job, did what I needed to do for about four, four and a half years. At the time, I was about a I turned into a real bad alcoholic. So I hit rock, rock bottom, uh, violated parole, ended up going back to prison. And honestly, it was a blessing in disguise because I needed that in order to stop. So I've got a proposition for you. My view is that there should be no prisons whatsoever for any reason at all. I'm, I'm all about that as well. I think that there are better ways to do, um, to dole out punishments per se, um, I'd say that um, you can do the restitution is by far much better alternative than locking someone. I mean, you're literally kidnapping someone mm-hmm. indeterminate amount of time based on an arbitrary whim of some other group of people. Most of the laws should be just tossed out. The only law you really need is don't steal. What's something that you think might be an obvious next step that people can take? We, we need to attack this problem from an educational level because obviously i'm not saying you know abolish everything tomorrow it'll be it will be chaos because you know people just don't know enough they don't know enough to break out of their indoctrinated mindsets and learn how to actually voluntarily coexist with each other and not continually vote and try to ram your opinion down your neighbor's throat because you voted for this guy because that guy sucks and he's evil and I don't want him to get in, but my guy's the savior. People are like, well, we can't live in a theocracy. That's old. That's, you know, that's terrible. That's like barbaric stuff. I'm like, well, you know, we're living in the theocracy right now. It's just that the state is God. It's a religion. How government is truly 100% a religion when it boils down to it. The entity, the institution of government, it is made up of men and women like you and I and everyone else. And then they're able to do these supernatural things that we as individuals cannot do. Right. So, I mean, we got, we got the American flag. We got sacred symbols. They have the sacred texts. You know, like the Constitution. Mm-hmm. 
Oh boy. <laughs> Everything in power. Yeah. Comes from the constitution. All right. They have their saints, the presidents, the past presidents. I mean, look how they uh, memorialize them. Lincoln Memorial, Mount Rushmore. Are those usually located outside of their temples, their Capitol buildings, their <laughs> white houses, their pentagons. And, you know, you can't have a good religion without denominations, Republicans and Democrats and even the Libertarian Party, which I do not advocate because they partake of the political system to enact change from the political system. But I digress. They also have priests like your congressmen and your Senate representatives of the people. Mm hmm. Churches, which are your schools. Obviously, if the churches are schools, then teachers are preachers. Then you got the common prayer in school, Pledge of Allegiance and all that jazz. It goes on. You got the televangelists, the talking heads on the media. You got your tithes and offerings, your taxes. You got your messiahs, the new candidates that are coming out every four to eight years or whatever. <laughs> hey, I promise you I will do better this time. And then you got church discipline, which is the police, the law enforcement. And then you have crusades, which is your war and your military and conquest. And then lastly, I would say your human sacrifice, which is connected to the crusades. Or even uh, the prison system. Or even that. Yeah. Even sacrifice or, yeah, I mean, that could be taken on multiple levels. But if it's in the name of government and political uh, agenda, then yes, that's that's your religion. Or we could even go one level further. Abortion, uh, human sacrifice, and they sacrifice them on the altar of uh, convenience or pocket or money. 100%. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all against that. I mean, a lot of people have opinions on that, but I don't care what they think. Um, you you should have uh, had better judgment. It's not that child's fault. Well, gosh, I'm encouraged. And you're not even you're not even like totally on board with the Bible and stuff. And it's like, I I don't think I've heard you say one thing that's unbiblical. You got to be consistent. And if you, if it doesn't pass the consistency, then there's something wrong with your principles or something wrong. Or there's a contradiction somewhere and you have to, you have to go over that. It really all stems from just voluntary interaction, non-aggression principle, just do no harm. Don't steal, treat everybody as you would want to be treated. Don't treat people as you would not want to be treated. I think that the apophatic has more of a, a punch to it, you know, saying it in the negative. It should just be that easy, but a lot of people need that education. And that's what I try to do. The main passage that people will turn to to say, well, no, you should just submit to the government. If they say that, hey, you shouldn't, you shouldn't smoke weed and then they're going to penalize you for doing all this type of stuff, then you should just go along with it and then and say, yes, sir, and put up with everything that they, what they tell you to do, whether it's um, just or unjust, it doesn't matter. And the passage they cite for that is Romans 13. And so I'll, I'll read it oh, real quick course. and I'll, I'll give you some, I'll give you some ammunition to use against people that say this to you. Please you, do. I already have some, trust me. Okay. Well, I, I want to give you some Bible that you can, that you can give back to them and say, and use the very verse that they're quoting against them if they just stop and think about it. So this is Romans 13 verse one, let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Well, that's a pretty open-shut case. Like, next argument, look in the very middle of that. Rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Mm-hmm. Whose definition of good conduct and bad conduct? The authorities themselves, contrary to, to what's really right and what's really wrong, according to God's laws? Or do they get to make up their own definition of good conduct and bad conduct? That's the whole question. So what if someone who claims to be a ruler is a terror to good conduct? Well, then that means, according to that verse, that he's not a ruler. 
it defines what a ruler is. A ruler is not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. So what happens if somebody claims to be an authority and says, I'm, I'm going to punish good people and reward bad people? Well, then by definition, that person's not a ruler, not an authority. There are a lot of things that are wrong to do. Uh, there's a big difference between a sin and a crime. It's a sin to get drunk. It's not a crime unless you hurt somebody. Yeah, yeah. And then it's not being drunk that's a crime. It's the hurting the person that's a crime. They wouldn't take that to, like, parents. What if a parent is, like, beating their wife or beating their children? They wouldn't say, oh, you're supposed to submit to them because your parents are your authority. Right. And so when you take it to that, just... One little parallel, the whole thing falls apart, and yet they still cling to, you know, you just have to obey whatever anybody says who says that they're an authority. And that that's my beef with, like, the whole thing with authority. Like, you're supposed to respect this person simply because of his position. Well, it doesn't make his commands right. Right. It doesn't legitimize the thief in any way. It's been great talking, Dan. Hey, likewise. I appreciate you taking the time and wanting to hear what I got to say. So thank you.